about this. this I have to go. <laughs> <laughs> people you don't want us to hear these little snips, snippets of conversation so um okay i think it's a good time to um get going um hold on a second what does it say oh all right okay no problem um Okay, so um, welcome everybody to the California Botanical Society speaker series featuring early career botanists. Um, please mute yourselves. I'll say that probably several more times. Um, my name is Amy Litt. I'm currently the president of the society. And before I introduce this month's speaker, um, I want to plug our annual banquet and members meeting, which will be April 30th, April 30th at UC Santa Cruz. Um, the keynote speaker will be Kathleen Kay. And in addition to the banquet, there'll be field trips. Um, we're still working out some of the final details, so there will be more information forthcoming, I think very soon, actually. So please stay tuned for that. Um, okay, so today's speaker is Mitchell Coleman from the Tejon Ranch Conservancy. Mitchell got his BS in biology from Westmont College and an MS from California State University Bakersfield. And he joined the Conservancy in 2015 as part of the Environmental Educational Partnership Impacting Colleges and Careers. Um, and this supported his master's work on the ecophysiology of sulfur shrublands in the San Joaquin Desert. Currently, Mitchell is wearing at least four hats that I know of. He's research botanist and land manager um, at Tejon Ranch. He also recently stepped up to take on the role of membership director for the California Botanical Society. And for this, we are eternally grateful to him. And he's doing a fantastic job. He's also currently a PhD student at UC Riverside, which also happens to be where I am employed. So he and I have two points of connection. And he is the father of two, which I believe he will tell us a bit more about. So with no further ado, Mitchell, Please tell us about your work and about the ranch. Sure, okay. Well, about uh, doing membership at the society, Amy, I, it's an absolute honor. Uh, so I, I thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's a fun thing to do. Um, okay, so are you seeing my screen? Um, I can no longer see people. Uh, can someone say that you can see that? Yes, we can okay, see it. Okay, cool. Okay, I'm gonna hide the panel and okay, we're good to go. So hello everyone. Yes, uh, my name is Mitchell Coleman. Um, I am going to give a seminar, a quick seminar about conservation on Tejon Ranch. Um, and then about two thirds of the way through, we'll switch gears and talk about the ecophysiology of halo fights. So I hope it's kind of a hybrid uh, seminar in that sense. I hope that's okay. Um, but there'll be some pretty pictures and a little bit of data at the end. Um, so it should be fun, I'll have fun. Um, so an outline. Uh, I'll start out by introducing myself uh, since this seminar series is for early career botanists. I, 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 I'm one of those still. Um, and so I'll introduce myself uh, and then I'll delve emphasis on the word brief, a brief history of Tejon Ranch. Um, this is a plant talk, not a people talk, uh, but it sets the stage, I think, for how Tejon Ranch came to be conserved and how the Tejon Ranch Conservancy came into existence in the first place. So it's, it's an important thing to mention, I think, a little bit about the history, how Tejon Ranch is conserved. That's a question a lot of people have. How is it actually conserved? Um, why is it so important for conservation? Then I'll take you on a lightning fast uh, photo tour of the Botanical <laughs> Diversity of Tejon. Uh, just like it's, the diversity of Tejon is, is so high uh, it's it's impossible to do it justice in a talk like this, so lightning fast, but I'll show you some pretty pictures of some of the uh, native plants on Zahon. Then we'll talk a little bit about the riparian enhancement projects the Conservancy has been pursuing over the last few years. And then lastly, we'll switch gears and talk about the ecophysiology of halophytes with some data. So bear with me on the first part. If you are a data person, this will mostly be uh, qualitative, but there's some data at the end, I promise. Um, okay, so a little bit about me. Um, my name is Mitchell. Uh, I was raised in Bakersfield. I'm a Bakersfield native. And so talking about Tejon Ranch, it's always been a fixture in my life. And to this day, I've been doing work on Tejon 
uh, for the past seven years professionally now, but it, I still, uh, it still hasn't sunk in, frankly, that I get to work professionally on Tejon Ranch. I grew up uh, in Bakersfield and did scouting trips amongst other things on the ranch when I was a kid, new ranch employees. And so it still boggles me that I, I get to work on Tejon Ranch. It's a real privilege that I'm eternally grateful that I found my, my dream job so early on. Um, as you can see, I'm a, I, have, I have three little kids, uh, all under the age of six. Uh, and so I'm, I'm typically highly caffeinated. And if you ever uh, see me frazzled, you know why. I love my kiddos very much, uh, but they're live wires, let me tell you. Um, I, I did uh, my uh, undergraduate work on the coast in, in Santa Barbara, Westmont College, came home after that, uh, did a master's degree at CSUB, worked for a few years as a botanical consultant and also did some adjuncting at the local community college. And um, since 2018, I've been on staff at the Tejon Conservancy and I'm the science manager and also I'm a PhD student at UC Riverside and Lou Santiago's lab. So I get to have a lot of fun. This is it's just a lot of fun all around. Um, but enough about me, uh, let's talk about Tejon. Um, and so I imagine most folks on the seminar already know about Tejon, um, but I know there are some out-of-staters on the call as well. Uh, so where is Tejon Ranch? Here's a, here's a view of California, Los Angeles being here. It's just about an hour and a half drive north of metropolitan Los Angeles. And so it's sort of in basically Southern California. And it's 270,000 acres, cumulatively speaking. It's the largest single piece of private property in the state of California. It's a huge property. There are other larger landowners in the, in the north part of the state, as far as I understand, but they own different parcels. And so Tejon is one property. And it's, it's just amazing. It's a quarter of 1%. Uh, so just acreage alone makes it remarkable. But there's a lot more than just acreage that makes it remarkable in addition to that. So I'm going to give a really brief history, a people history of Tejon, knowing that this is a botanical talk, uh, but it's important to, to set the stage. And I'll start by acknowledging that Tejon Ranch has been occupied by indigenous peoples for thousands of years. We look at this, this, uh, this aerial view of, of pre-contract tribal territories, the area where Tejon Ranch is situated today is sort of a Cross, a cultural crossroads in addition to an ecological crossroads. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that later, a lot, but it was a cultural crossroads as well. Uh, the Kiawasu, the Foothill Yokuts, the Chumash, the Katenamucks, the Tatavians, they all had a presence in the area that is Tejon Ranch today, and you can still see remnants of that today. Uh, the Tejon Ranch Conservancy uh, doesn't actively look at this stuff. Uh, we have a policy of non-investigation. We don't look at it, uh, but it's important to mention the home has been inhabited by people for thousands of years. Uh, but if we flash forward thousands of years, literally, to the Spanish and Mexican era, if you look at this map here on the right, in the Mexican era, the area that is to home today existed as four separate ranchos. And the story goes, even before that, there was a Spanish regiment that was coming down this canyon. If you're looking at my mouse, there was a Spanish regiment that was coming down this canyon. Someone saw a dead badger, and they decided to name the canyon Badger Canyon or Tejon Canyon. And that's uh, where the Rancho El Tejon got its name. Um, so that was, that was the Spanish and Mexican era. Fast forward still, skipping over a lot of important details. Uh, as California became part of the United States in 1850, there was a gentleman by the name of Edward Fitzgerald Beale uh, who just fell in love with this area. He was a surveyor and he fell in love with this area in particular and he was wealthy to boot. So he bought these four separate Mexican ranchos. They were in the form of Mexican land grants. He bought them and consolidated them into the property we know today as Tejon Ranch. And then he gave the property when he passed away to his son, Truxton Beale. These are big names in Bakersfield. So Truxton Avenue is a major thoroughfare, the Beale Memorial Library, named after these two, these two guys. Um, going forward in, in history still, in the early 1900s, the Chandler family that was big in the LA Times, they purchased the ranch and ran it very traditionally for most of their tenure. Um, they brought the company, the Tejon Ranch Company, into incorporation in the 1930s and fully public in the 1970s. Look at this old uh, ranch company logo with the badger on it. We found that in, in a canyon a few years ago. Really interesting bit of history there. Um, 
And then in the 1990s, the Tejon Ranch Company was a full-fledged corporation. This is the Tejon of my childhood. Uh, so there was a number of different land use pursuits during that time, hunting, uh, filming, some petroleum, the California aqueduct that goes through the ranch. Um, of course, ranching has always been done, small scale development and agriculture. That's the Tejon of my childhood. But in the early 2000s, the company had a transition toward land development. And Tejon, or rather California, being what it is with the California Environmental Quality Act and other pieces of legislation, the Tejon Ranch Company knew that they were going to face opposition to essentially building three new uh, cities, massive projects. And so to their credit, they, they approached a, var a variety of environmental organizations and invited them to the negotiating table in the early 2000s. And that was how Tejon Ranch first became conserved. Over the course of a number of years, in 2008, they brokered this agreement that's fully called the Tejon Ranch Conservation and Land Use Agreement, or the RWA, wherein these five signatory organizations essentially agreed not to oppose developments on 30,000 acres of the ranch, so just about 12%, in exchange for permanent conservation of 240,000 acres, so 88%, we say 90. And so the 90% of the ranch was to be managed forever by an independent organization. Um, that is where the Tejon Ranch Conservancy was born in 2008. And so we are an independent nonprofit organization that works to enhance the biodiversity of Tejon Ranch and share it with people, uh, with you know, public access and stewardship and education. These are our kind of four core programmatic areas. I'm on the science and stewardship end of things. Prior to my time and even still, this, the Conservancy uh, collaborated with a bunch of fantastic academic collaborators. I think our library of internal uh, peer reviewed journals is over 30 at this point, maybe approaching 40. Um, lots of stewardship work still, but even more so back in the day, lots of invasive plant management. We've been bringing school groups out uh, for a few years now. And we do pretty much weekly tours as well, hikes amongst other things. So that's the Tejon Ranch Conservancy in a nutshell. Um, but a lot of people still are, it's, it's confusing. Let's be honest, it's confusing. How exactly is Tejon Ranch conserved? Because there's the Tejon Ranch Conservancy and there's the Tejon Ranch Company. They sound very similar, but they're two different organizations. So speaking of the Tejon Ranch Conservancy, a nonprofit organization, we don't own any part of Tejon Ranch. The, the company still fully owns Tejon Ranch and has reserved rights, ranching among other things. So the conservancy specifically holds the conservation easements on Tejon. That's shown here on this left-hand map. But, uh, to date, there are 10 conservation easements and five that are in the future, but it's all still fully conserved land. And it's one of our core responsibilities to monitor these easement areas and assess if there's any prohibitive uses going on and also changes in conservation values through time in the context of climate change and those other things. So conservation easements, that's what the Tejon Ranch Conservancy is responsible for. But there's also a whole other plan. It's called the Tumship, the Tehachapi Upland Multiple Species Habitat Conservation Plan. Try saying that 10 times fast. It's an official wildlife service plan um, in agreement with the landowner, so the conservancy is not directly involved, uh, that sets aside uh, certain parts of the ranch at high elevation in the Tehachapi Mountains uh, for very specific species, the condor probably being the most famous. So these are sort of two separate outlets for how Tejon Ranch is, is formally conserved. But why go to all this bother? Why is Tejon Ranch uh, conserved in the way it is? Why did all these uh, environmental organizations sign this really interesting, novel, unusual, somewhat controversial uh, land use agreement? Well, it has to do with where Tejon is situated geographically, geographically at least from a biogeographic standpoint. Um, Tejon Ranch sits at the confluence of four of California's um, major ecoregions. The southern spine of the Sierra Nevada comes down right here, the lower part, it's the Tehachapi Mountains, but at the higher elevations of the ranch, you are essentially in the Sierra Nevadas. The Mojave Desert, the northwesternmost extent, comes in over here, bringing Mojavean vegetation. The coast ranges come in from the west. You get a lot of chaparral, even a little influence of coastal sage scrub, not much, but a little, you can sort of feel it. And the great central valley, the San Joaquin Desert, 
also brings an influence there. So these four ecoregions smash together in the heart of Tohon Ranch. And as a result, you get amazing co-occurrences of species that you don't really see anywhere else in such a small land area. 10% of California native plant taxa are represented, 60% of California plant families, 70 special status species and counting, nine endemics and counting that more or less only occur on Tohon, but they're, you know, they, a few, with a few exceptions that occur slightly off Tohon, but in the Tohon region. So it's an amazing place for a botanist to work, amazing botanically. Of course, California being a botanical hotspot because of our Mediterranean's head climate, Tohon is diverse even by California standard. That's why Tohon is so important for conservation. So just to give you a snapshot here, if we are standing at more or less the geographic center of the ranch, this is called Winter's Ridge, and looking to the northwest, across the spine of, of Tohon, you can see that we are essentially in the Sierra Nevadas right now, right? On uh, the foreground here, we have white fir, Abies con color. Um, off screen, there are a variety of Pinus species, uh, Jeffrey, Coulteri, Sabiniana, amongst others. Also, Calicedrus decurrens, incense cedar. It's the Sierras. Uh, but a little bit further down, you get a whole mix of oak woodlands, uh, valley oaks, black oaks, blue oaks, inland live oaks, canyon live oaks, you name it, all sorts of really oaky ranch. Um, even further down still, you pick up the grasslands of the San Joaquin Desert with amazing cadre of native uh, unique species as well. But on this same ridge, if we turn around and look to the south, so the southeast on the same ridge, not just a stone's throw away from that previous picture, now we're looking toward the La Liebre Mountains, the northwesternmost extent of the Mojave Desert, a lot of chaparral vegetation, a little bit of coastal influence with some bacteria and Artemisia, some other things. We're not even talking about wildlife, this is just plants. So it's, 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 it's an amazing, and this is from one vantage point, you're sort of seeing the, these ecoregions smashed together in the heart of the home. Okay. So that's one reason, so very botanically, biologically diverse. But another reason for why Tohon is so important for conservation is that it sits in the middle of a huge network of, of, of connected habitats. And modern day conservation really focuses on connecting habitat as opposed to individual species. Of course, the individual species are still really important, but habitat connectivity is sort of where the field of conservation is going. This is an older map, it's a little hard to see. So here is a, a bigger one. And you can sort of see that Tohon Ranch is at the center of this huge corridor of conserved land, both public and private, from the Los Padres National Forest, oops, sorry, uh, Wind Wolves Preserve, the Los Angeles National Forest, uh, TNC just formally announced the Randall Preserve a few weeks ago, really exciting to have some partners to the north. That it's just really close to connecting to the Sequoia National Forest. And so Tohon Ranch sits at the center of all this, all this. So in terms of Habitat connectivity, it's, it's, it's huge, it's huge. And if we look at it even in more close detail from a, from a lateral perspective, uh, next slide, there we go. From a lateral perspective, north uh, to the left here, we can see that Tohon is a, a huge vector for genetic dispersal and connectivity. And, and it's a huge network for migratory species, and all kinds of stuff. So we'll just, just look at the arrows here and there it is. Um, all these lands are conserved and it provides a network for all these things. So habitat connectivity, that's a huge reason why Tohon is so important for conservation. Okay, so um, now we are going to go through a, probably the quickest uh, botanical tour of Tohon um, that's ever been done. Uh, it, it, it's, it's impossible to do this justice. So I'm gonna go as fast as I can because I've got a time limit here. Um, we're going to start on the San Joaquin Desert side, focusing on grasslands and forb lands. On a banner year, when, we, when we've had plenty of precipitation, it's just beautiful over on the, on the San Joaquin Desert. All kinds of lupins and amsinkia, poppies, all kinds of rare flowers. This is called the Campo Benito pasture, the pretty pasture. Some people call it the Milky Way. <laughs> this is kind of a funny story, but important. Um, Maybe you'll remember a few years ago, um, at the end of 2018, right before Governor Brown left office, office uh, there was the California Biodiversity Initiative that came out. It was sort of a, a precursor to the 30 by 30 plan that the Natural Resource Agency is working on now. And so a colleague and I were looking at this one day and we thought, hmm, that looks really similar. That, that's familiar. Oh, wait a minute. That, that's Tohon Ranch, that's Campo Benito. And so somehow we made the cover photo of, of the California Biodiversity Initiative uh, 
I, th I think this was a draft, but if, if 30 by 30, it's sort of coming online now. Um, it's sort of coming online now, but if, if they want to consider using Tahone as the cover photo again, I say have at it. Um, so anyway, that's kind of a funny story. I digress. Um, I'm using the term San Joaquin Desert intentionally. It's not a term you hear a lot of ecologists, botanists, even in California use. Uh, the reason being, in part, because the San Joaquin or the Central Valley, uh, the San Joaquin Valley, which those are also appropriate terms, um, the San Joaquin area has, was left out of the out of the a lot a lot of the original um, surveys of what was considered to be deserts in Western North America. Looking here, there's a big gap here that should say San Joaquin Desert. Uh, in part, this has to do uh, with the massive state of, of in, environmental destruction at the San Joaquin. If you've driven through, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You can see the time lapse here. These green areas essentially show the growth of agriculture in the last uh, 200, 300 years. But there was a seminal paper that came out in 2011 uh, by Germano et al. that made the case that in terms of precipitation and soils and native species, both plant and wildlife, uh, San Joaquin really is a desert. And so it deserves that classification just like the other deserts in the American West. And so I, I use the term San Joaquin Desert, but Valley and Central Valley are still both, both acceptable terms as well. So uh, just uh, some, some quick pictures of the San Joaquin Desert grasslands, the, the famous Tejon Hills, which has a huge cadre of rare taxa, on a good year, you can get really nice wildflower displays like these Amsinkia, which are pretty common. Here's another picture of the Campo Bonito pasture with a bunch of plagiobothries, popcorn flowers. This is why some people call it the Milky Way. Um, and then over here on the north end of the ranch, this is what we call white wolf. Um, a lot of really cool stuff up there as well. Um, so just a name drop, I'm, I'm totally cherry picking here. Um, but this is my favorite, so I gave it its own slide. Uh, this is the calico monkey flower, Diplocus pictus. Um, my favorite wildflower of all time. Isn't it beautiful? I love that. I love that floral pattern. It's got a really interesting ecological niche, as it turns out. It has to do with uh, scrofularia and ribes, gooseberry, and small mammals and rocky outcrops. I don't, I don't want to take too long to describe it, but it's got a really interesting niche, and it's just a gorgeous, gorgeous flower. So um, honorable mention there. A few other honorable mentions of the San Joaquin, and these are all on Tejon. Uh, Fritillaria striata, which is the striped adobe lily. Uh, the Tejon poppy, uh, the California jewel flower, called Lanthus californicus, that was a neat find a few years ago. Uh, the Kern mallow, an endangered Kern mallow, as well as the jewel flower. Um, the endangered Bakersfield cactus, a subspecies of Amputia basilaris. Um, and then the Comanche Point Leia, completely endemic to Tejon, or mostly endemic to Tejon, the sunflower family. So a few honorable mentions uh, right there. Um, pe people who know me know that I love halo fights, and I'm going to talk about this toward the end if there's time. Um, but I just want to mention that the native upland vegetation of the San Joaquin Desert is mostly saltbush vegetation and some other halophytic vegetation. So. Uh, uh, this will, uh, we'll wait until a little bit later on to talk about that, but uh, the unloved community of California, some people like to call it, but I love it. So I hope, I hope you'll love it too. Um, okay, transitioning a little bit higher elevation, uh, we'll look at some oak woodlands. As I mentioned, Tejon Ranch is a very oaky property. Um, depending on who you ask, we have between nine and 13 species of oaks. This list uh, lists 11 with a couple of hybrids at the end. So it depends on who you ask. I, I, I'm going to go ahead and say we have nine uh, and then these hybrids over here. Um, so uh, just to name some of the dominant landscape level oaks, we have valley oaks, the largest uh, uh, oak by canopy volume on the ranch, it's deciduous. Uh, we've been coring these lately in a dendrochronology study and we found that the largest oak, a valley oak, or the oldest valley oak on Tejon is over 300 years old. It's a cool study, um, but I digress. Uh, blue oaks, um, an evergreen oak. To my knowledge, the oldest blue oak, uh, or oak rather, in California came from Tejon Ranch on the, on the uh, Antelope Valley side. It germinated extensively in the late 1400s, and that was a, that was a blue oak. Um, really cool study there. Um, black oaks at high elevation, and you can see these beautiful fall foliage colors that we get on a good year. Uh, it's more of a mesic species. Um, wonderful, wonderful black oaks. 
and co often co-occurring with the black oaks are coniferous forests. And so we have white firs and incense cedars, a whole cadre of pinus species um, at the higher elevations when you're in the Sierra Nevadas. Um, so beautiful, beautiful conifers. A few honorable mentions of special status plants that occur at high elevations, often under conifer canopies. Uh, the uh, the Tahone jewel flower, Strypanthus mitarosii, that was recently described in, in Madronio, um, and kind of entirely endemic to Tahone Ranch, one known locality. Beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, plants. Then we have uh, the Fort Tahone woolly flower. We were looking at this uh, this past couple years. It's a sunflower. Um, really cool, uh, not that well documented at the home. Um, this, as it turns out, uh, we thought for a while that we had a really cool remnant population of limber pine on the home. It turns out that's not the case. Um, this is actually sugar pine, but I'm mentioning it here in the last hope that maybe, just maybe, we might have some um, a pinus flexulus on the ranch, would be, which would be a really cool range extension for that species. And then we have a really cool mint that we were looking at last year. And I, I just, I, I was enthused by it, and I, it's a monardella, but I, I forget the Latin, but it's a uh, cool, uh, restricted within the range, some special status high elevation plants. Uh, okay, transitioning over toward the Mojave side, we pick up chaparral vegetation on the ranch. There's a few Arctostaphylos species, Arctostaphylos glauca, glandulosa, perii. I know that Arctostaphylos is kind of a mess taxonomically, but that's what I call them. Um, we have chemise. Uh, Ceanothus, uh, Garia flavescens, some pretty uh, mature, a long time since they've burned chaparral shrublands. Um, my advisor for a master's degree, Dr. Pratt, is a chaparral ecophysiologist. So this was my first introduction to the home, uh, looking at some of the chaparral over here. A beautiful chaparral. Dropping down into the Mojave Desert properly, we start to pick up uh, Joshua tree woodlands and Mojave and scrublands. And so, um, a lot of Ericamaria species over here, of course, the Joshua trees themselves and all the, the wonderful belly flowers that Mojave Desert is famous for. We get all of those beautiful wildflower displays on the right here and some really nice remnant uh, patches of, of native bunch grasses all on the Mojave side of the ranch. And last, oh, oh, two more slides, um, just some honorable mentions of, of special status Mojave Desert plants. On the ranch, we have Ariaganum callistum, the Tehachapi buckwheat, almost entirely endemic to Tejon Ranch. Um, Allium berulii, uh, which is a volcanic substrate associated onion, really cool. Um, this is actually not uh, a special status plant, but I've only ever seen it once. Uh, Picaringia montana, chaparral pea. It's got kind of an interesting evolutionary bottleneck going on, so I thought I'd mention it because it's, anyway, it's a whole other conversation. And then lastly, we have Lupinus personiae which was discovered by Neil and others a few years ago on the ranch that, to my knowledge, is only known from one other locality in the San Gabriel's to the south, a really interesting and unique looking lupin species. Okay, and then lastly, we have over 21 watersheds on the ranch. I'm just listing the major three right here, El Paso, Cajon, uh, and Tunis Creeks that are perennially flowing and have all sorts of wetland vegetation associated with them as well. Okay, with the time left, um, we'll just quickly go through how the Tejon Conservancy manages its biodiversity. It all stems from one document called the Ranch-Wide Management Plan, which is part of that initial 2008 agreement, wherein the Conservancy has the ability to work collaboratively with the landowner to focus on uh, alterations in operations, amongst other things that prioritize enhancement of specific ecosystems, grasslands, woodlands, especially riparian and wetland areas. There's over 400 uh, best management practices or BMPs that are part of this plan. So we're not going to go even go close to scratching the surface of this today. Um, but we do, because there are so many, we do have some priority ones. And I'm going to specifically focus on one of those 400 uh, priority best management practices, which has to do with restoring native riparian habitats. Um, next slide. There we go. OK. so. Uh, it's known just at the observational level, uh, especially for riparian and wetland areas, that summer livestock raising can have a pretty detrimental effect uh, on, on biodiversity and structural complexity of, of these systems. Now, there's an emerging body of literature that has to be acknowledged that is starting to emphasize that grazing is not just a, is not merely a bad thing. 
Um, grazing can enhance biodiversity if it's done right. And so Conservancy wants to do it right. And so we have these efforts in place to specifically manage the way cattle are grazed um, in the summer across these uh, riparian and wetland corridors. And so to that end, we've established a number of different riparian enhancement areas for to date, uh, which is just over 2,000 acres, wherein we have agreements with the cattle ranchers and the company um, to manage the way cattle move uh, in, the summer, in the summertime. And then we measure the responses of the vegetation and the wildlife to see if simply removing cattle uh, from these areas during the summer has an effect on biodiversity and structural complexity. And then we do weeding efforts as well. Some of them, these areas are invaded by tamarisk and rundo. Um, so just to quickly go through, oops, um, we, we do this by modifying ranch infrastructure, expanding water distribution, reducing the size of riparian pastures. That's how it's accomplished on the ground. And then we monitor um, with independent uh, collaborations and, and RDM monitoring, photo monitoring, veg monitoring. There's Neil Kramer there. I'm, I told you right here, Neil, good picture. Uh, we do vegetation sampling um, every year to assess change over time. Um, we're, and we're working on a manuscript right now from one of the first projects that was established. And so I mentioned that because I, I don't have any data to show um, on these projects because we're working on it. We're hammering out the details for a manuscript right now. I think my prediction is that the statistical analysis will bear out what the photos bear out qualitatively. So I just have photos, but I think statistics will back this up that biodiversity and structural complexity of these systems has increased through time. So in 2014, for example, over here in Sakatar Canyon, when this was established, it was mostly Bromus diandrus back in that time. But as you can see through time into 2017 and 2020, there's a slow shift to, to native species. We, get, we start to see some stipa in here, even some Mulembergia. Um, these are the native grasses, uh, all kinds of native forbs starting to uptick, even some um, Ericamaria coming in. So a, 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 an increase in, in native species. Same goes for this uh, really cool wetland system that was part of the same project back in the day, mostly dominated by invasive annual grasses, Polypogon, Monspeliensis, amongst others. But flash forward uh, six years, we have Urtica and Junca species. Salix, Populus, I think it's been, um, just looking at it qualitatively, I think this has been a success. And the statistics bear this out. Uh, um, but stay tuned for the manuscript. <laughs> um, OK, Tuna Spring, same story. Um, going through this really quickly. I don't want to spend too long, but same story. We got uh, now, as of 2020, over these past 10 years, uh, we get Critica, Shotoplectus, uh, Disticlus, all kinds of native species. I've seen birds nesting in here, uh, tricolored blackbirds even nesting in here. For a lot of the 2010, when it was mostly denuded annual grasses, so that's a success. And really what we're focusing on now is what we call the Tahone Creek Enhancement Project. Our goal now, I think that uh, on the basis of these really small acreages, uh, we've established that this passive restoration technique is effective. And so what we wanna do now is bring this management technique to scale. And we've chosen to focus on the Tohone Creek watershed, which is outlined here in blue. It's over 40,000 acres and eight stream miles. So working on this right now, to date, we're really only one phase in, that's the Shinak pasture um, outlined here in yellow. That's what we're currently doing the same grazing protocol in, but we're trying uh, to expand that. In fact, this year, fingers crossed, knock on wood. Yes, this table is wood. Uh, we will uh, start phase two over here uh, in the lookout pasture, the same exact protocol we've done before. These are thousands of acres now relative to dozens of acres. So it's really bringing this enhancement approach to scale. Um, it's in that pasture, as I said, we've been doing it since 2015, this, this seasonal grazing approach. And so Similar to the past two projects, you can see, uh, especially with this bottom row of pictures, a massive increase um, of, of cover and riparian species uh, diversity uh, through time. So, okay, if I have any time left at all, I might go a bit over time. So please stop me if I do or or or, or don't. Uh, don't stop me if you if you if you're liking this. We're going to switch gears uh, to my personal research. Uh, on halo flights. Um, uh, this all started 
when I was a master's student at CSU Bakersfield. Um, I studied the factors affecting seedling recruitment of saltbush shrubs um, and just got a couple of papers out about this. this these were my first two peer reviewed uh, first author publications. It was really exciting and challenging. <laughs> a lot of fun doing that though. Um, I had a great time doing this project and that's the project that brought me to the conservancy in the first place. Um, so I had a lot of fun doing that and it left an itch that still wanted to be scratched. <laughs> I just fell in love with halo fights. And so when the opportunity presented itself, I, I hopped back in the academic game and now I'm at UC Riverside and I'm at Lou Santiago's lab trying to get more into plant ecophysiology. And so if you'll let me talk for another 15 minutes or so, I'll share with you the results from my first year project uh, that I started back in 2020 um, that I just presented on a few weeks ago. But this is the result of my first year project. I, I essentially assessed osmotic adjustments of more halophytic species across a gradient of salinity. And so uh, as with everything that I've been talking about up until now, this is not my work. Um, I stand on the shoulders of giants. Uh, it, it's really true. And so the same goes for this project. I had a lot of help throughout the way. Uh, first and foremost, my PI, Lou Santiago, uh, had a lot of help. Uh, it's uh, thank you to everyone. Um, and the core uh, sort of uh, ecological framework of my dissertation, at least how it's currently shaping up, is the uh, sort of trade-off that's sometimes discussed in terms of specialization versus plasticity. Generally speaking, you can think of this trade-off in terms of some species being specialized to rather extreme habitats, let's just say extremely drought tolerant uh, a species that, that survive drought really well. Those specialized species have traits that allow them to perform in these extreme conditions at the expense of not being able to perform as well along a wider gradient of conditions. And so those are specialized taxa relative to taxa that are more plastic with regard to their traits. Uh, they occur along a wider range of ecological conditions at the expense of not being able to perform as well at the extremes. And so it's sometimes discussed in terms of a trade-off. I'm sort of cheating here with these pictures because it's not, it's not that easy, of course. But generally speaking, I think it illustrates the point, looking at, at this in terms of soil moisture um, and niche breath. Uh, so in my example, uh, chaparral species are are the specialists to extreme drought tolerance. Oaks are a bit more plastic. Invasive annual grass, uh, grasses are more plastic still. Conifers are a little bit more plastic, but they prefer more mesic conditions. And then on the extreme specialized other end, we have hydrophytic tax. I'd run a poll back for that. I think they require water, standing water in many cases, to carry out their life processes. So that's the base framework for where I'm going. Um, of course, focusing on, on salty stuff. So I don't think we need to uh, do any convincing um, in this group that climate change is a phenomenon that we need to be concerned with. It's often discussed in terms of precipitation and temperature fluctuations through time, but of course, oh, I need to click on this to get it to work. Uh, of course, it's, it's acknowledged that there are other downstream effects beyond precipitation and temperature. One of the less acknowledged downstream effects is variations in soil salinization. And that's important, something to be concerned about um, because soil salinity is, high soil salinity specifically, is something that most plants are not physiologically equipped to handle. For most plants, anything above about five millisiemens per centimeter of sodium chloride in the soil kills them. They're not able to maintain turgor. Um, it's, it's not good. And this is mostly a concern in the agricultural world. In fact, a lot of the halo fight research is agricultural research. Uh, so globally speaking, that's what this figure is here. It's estimated 25 million agricultural acres are lost uh, to salinization every year. That's about the qu a quarter the size of California. It's huge. Uh, so there's food, food security implications. But there are ecological implications as well. For example, this little uh, community down here on the lower right-hand corner on Tejon Ranch this used to be a really healthy riparian corridor with some upland wildflowers, but for whatever reason, I don't know why, uh, it has become salinized. And you can see the salt extruding at the surface of the soil and the native plants in this area have become extirpated locally. 
Um, so there are ecological implications to soil salinization as well in the context of climate change. That gets us to halophytes. These are plants that are able to grow under salty conditions. These are salt adapted plants, it's affinity for salt. The definition of halophytes is somewhat arbitrary based on my review of the literature, but generally speaking, they're designated between plants that persist between five and 15 millisiemens per centimeter of sodium chloride. And I'm focusing on terrestrial plants. We're, we're, we're ignoring marine plants for now. Um, they're often considered specialists because they grow in these really extreme conditions. However, if you look at halophytes from a global perspective in terms of their taxonomy and their niche breath, their annuals, their shrubs, their trees, some grow in really mesic conditions, others in xeric conditions. They have a global distribution with the exception of the Arctic regions. They occur in over a quarter of all plant families. Um, so there are a lot of halophytes. And they vary widely in terms of their traits and their niche breadth. So the question is, rather than is often assumed, are halophytes merely specialists or are they generalists or are there, as I think, uh, wide degrees of intra and interspecific variation? And so that is my basic hypothesis at this point. I'm starting simple. Uh, hypothesize that measures of halophyte salinity tolerance are variable by species, predicting that obligate halophytes, these are the specialists, are most tolerant of extreme saline conditions, whereas facultative halophytes, the plastic halophytes, are more tolerant of variable saline conditions. So a simple set of hypotheses, testable. Um, to that end, I established this field transact, wherein I'm measuring 15 species, nine of which are halophytes, six of which are glycophytes or non-halophytes. I'll get into that in a second. 16 sites with varying soil salinity. This is the San Joaquin Desert with a couple of uh, ancillary sites. Um, across these uh, 15 species, I sampled three individuals per species per site and also measured soil salinity and leaf water potential, which is a, which is a metric of water status of a plant that can be affected by drought, but also uh, salinity. So uh, that's, my, that's my proxy for measuring salinity tolerance, is leaf water potential. And I measured this in the winter and summer of last year and analyzed uh, the statistics with aggression and ANOVA. These are my halophyte species. Real quickly, I have nine of them, uh, which based on observation, I have further broken down into obligate versus facultative, the reds being ob uh, obligate and the blues being facultative. And then I also measured co-occurring glycophytes. These are non-halophytic species that commonly co-occur with halophytes in the San Joaquin area. Ostensibly, they occupy these little microsites uh, where the salinity is not as high, and so they're able to persist, but you often see them co-occurring with halophytes. So I measured them as well just because they were there and I needed more species. Um, so in terms of results, um, this, th these two figures are just showing mean soil salinity by species across all sites. There's a lot to unpack here, so we'll use a color code uh, to, to look at some trends. Um, red, uh, the red circled means are the obligate halophytes, the blues are the facultative, and the greens are the glycophytes. And this is the same color trend for the next series of graphs or figures. And so just looking at it in terms of soil salinity by species, we can generally see that the obligate halophytes seem to occur in more salty conditions with one odd exception, Atroplex spinifera. Um, maybe I just categor categorized that wrong. Um, so uh, that needs to be revisited. But generally speaking, the obligate halophytes seem to occur in more saline conditions. That, that, that's a pretty easy prediction to affirm. But then in terms of uh, leaf water potential by species, a sort of similar pattern emerges. We can see obligate halophytes having a lower leaf water potential, lower leaf water potential, meaning more water stress within the vessel network of plants. And so that, in this case, um, I am assuming is affected by salinity. And so we can see the obligate halophytes having more water stressed tissues. Um, relative to the facultative halophytes and the glycophytes. And we can see the facultative sort of inhabiting the mid-range of these two figures and the glycophytes sort of inhabiting the, the more hydrated end of the 
Okay, so those are pretty simple figures. If we do a regression analysis with all of the data together, so this is species three, we can see a general positive relationship between soil salinity and leaf water potential. So generally speaking, as soil salinity increases, the water status of the plants, uh, the plants get more tense. Uh, so that's across all species, we get this, this positive relationship across seasons. However, it gets a lot messier if you break it down by species. Uh, so data is all over the place, it's quite messy. Uh, so again, using that same color code, if we, if we just circle the regression lines, we can see that obligate halophytes generally uh, seem to occur um, with this regression in more saline areas at lower leaf water potential, okay? So there, there are some exceptions here and some oddities and you know, like uh, some negative relationships that um, I think bear more. Now I need to do more sophisticated analyses than, than simply regression. So this is, just, this is just getting started. But in terms of basic conclusions so far, facultative halophytes are generally more stressed at higher salinities. Obligate halophytes are more stressed at lower salinities. But there is, there's a lot of exceptions. There's interspecific variation. There's, I didn't show you the intraspecific graphs. There's a lot of variation there that's sort of puzzling as well. So there are exceptions. And so this is just getting started, uh, and I'm having a blast doing it. Um, so with that, I hope I didn't go too much over time. I'm sorry if I did, but thank you so much for listening to me. Um, I had, this is fun. Um, I, I put the uh, Conservancy's uh, web address here in the, in the, right here, and then my personal email address and website. If you want to reach out, if you have any questions, or if I, if I said anything wrong, especially, please uh, don't feel shy, please correct me. And uh, with that being said, uh, if there are any questions, uh, that's it. Thank you. Okay, that was fantastic. That was a lot of information. Um, you did a really great job getting it all in. And actually, there's plenty of time um, if you want to talk for another five minutes. But um, in the meantime, um, uh, there's already a question in the um, chat, which I will read. It says, would you consider expanding study to other inland basins like Carrizo Plain, and would you reconsider A. lentiformis, parentheses, A. torii, as a halophyte? Whoops, you, sorry, somehow you got muted. I don't know how that happened. Um, Atroplex lentiformis and then one of the subspecies of lentiformis. Is that what it the question is? It doesn't seem, it's, I don't actually know because I don't know the taxonomy, but it just says a toria. I think it, I, oh, my impression yeah, okay. is it was a synonym. Yeah, yeah. well, uh, Lentiformis is one of the species I'm working with, not a torii. I think that's more of a Mojave species um, that doesn't occur in my neck of the woods, but certainly, yes, the long-term goal would be uh, to branch out a little further. The Carrizo is certainly of interest, as well as further east into the Mojave, there are some um, really cool atroplex out there, um, Alamus, for example, that I'd love to study as well. But um, <laughs> just with everything, I, I, I like to pick sites that are within driving distance for now, <laughs> but we'll see what time bears out. Well, also, you know, you have to start somewhere and then you then you move on from there. Um, Julie commented after she said it used to be a subspecies, now it's a species. Oh, okay. Yeah, um, I'll, I'll keep reading them uh, out of the chat. Um, there's one here that says, first of all, there's a lot, of, a lot of congratulations and stuff. I'll send you the chat when it's done. Um, have you found or utilized any of the data from the statewide Oak Survey in the 1980s that included sites on the Tejon Ranch? Yes, that study um, is, is, was used for baseline conditions analyses for uh, various easements for the Tejon Ranch. Um, back in the day, it predates me. Um, so I haven't personally done it, um, but just um, on authority, yes, uh, uh, that has uh, been included as absolutely. Okay, great. Uh, is it possible to correlate halophyte distribution to the water table depth? Oh, yes. Um, I want to do that desperately. Um, I, I, well, I, I wouldn't, well, hope, I hope you don't mind. I, I, um, I, I saw Jacob Spriester on this call 
Uh, he was in the same lab that I did my master's work in. He did that for his master's degree, and I want to emulate that. Uh, look at using stable isotopes to look at uh, water table depth, and it's hard work. It's doable. Um, I'd love to do that. Uh, and 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 Jacob is the is the is the authority on that. Um, so um, the short answer is yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Have there been any surveys? of changing natural vegetation in human unaltered sites, human unaltered sites that might inform us of what direction local climatic variables, e.g. rainfall, are going over the past decades. I guess that means sites that have been unaltered by humans, that have not been altered by humans. Well, uh, even on Tahone, Tahone being a private property that's been largely restricted from access for most of its history, so it's in really good ecological shape relative to some state parks I could point at. Um, despite that, I, there, I, I can't point to an example that's completely unaltered. I mean, there, there's been cattle grazing for over 150 years. There, nothing's pristine, of course. Um, so in terms of um, achieving pre-colonization conditions, I mean, that would, that's, that would be lovely, um, uh, but, uh, I don't know how to do that. <laughs> I don't know if anyone knows how to do that. Um, we're certainly an increase in biodiversity is a success. Any measurable increase in biodiversity and habitat quality is a success. If that carries on to eventually achieving uh, pre-invasion um, status, that's like the gold standard. Um, but uh, I, 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 restoration ecologists who are really more, way more knowledgeable than me could probably chime in here. Uh, I'll keep the questions are coming in here. If summer management involves removing cattle from the landscape, then where are they being grazed in summer instead? Are there lower impact areas of the ranch to graze on in summer? That's the cool thing about this project is that it's really a win-win between the conservancy and conservation oriented folks relative to the cattle ranchers, because in short, and I'm not a cattle rancher, so I'm a lay person. In short, the, the cattle ranchers don't want their stock to hang out in creeks during the summer. They want their stock to be up where the forage is, where they gain more weight and make more money at market. The problem is, historically speaking, uh, there's no water up there. Uh, there it's, this is to, it's the San Joaquin Desert, in the, at least in the examples we've been discussing, it's dry. So the water distribution has not been sufficient to water cattle. They de they've been dependent on the creeks for the most part for the history. So the way we achieve that uh, is by installing water infrastructure troughs and, and tanks and storage tanks where the grass is and then putting fencing in so that the cattle um, can be rotated out of the riparian pastures at certain times of the year. But uh, so the cattle ranchers are happier. So if there's more forage where they're going, but before this, there wasn't any water where they were going, or at least not enough water. Now there is. Uh, but I have learned <laughs> that water is a hard thing to generate. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we put in a water well. It, it, it's, uh, it's a whole story um, that it, the water well didn't produce the amount of water we were hoping for. Um, it's, so it, it's, it's a long, it's complicated. On the field, on the ground, conservation is complicated. Um, but it, it, um, that's it in a nutshell. We, we make changes to um, ranch infrastructure. Okay, great. Um, and then now we have uh, uh, awesome talk. Because your goal is restoration in some areas, have you considered reaching out to indigenous communities who've cultivated these lands and shaped plant distributions to support your goals of achieving restoration to pre-colonization conditions? Today, we haven't done that. Um, there is a federally recognized tribe in our area, the Tahone tribe. Um, we haven't had too much interaction with them up to date, um, but certainly that would be something that we'd be interested in the, in the long term. Um, uh, Sue Mazur is eager to talk with you about the use of herbarium specimens from Tahone to investigate phenological change over time. Do you have a sense of how many specimens in total have been collected from Tahone and are now in California herbaria? 
a, a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, <Sorry. laughs> uh, yeah. Vouchers have been collected um, by a number of different folks. I mean, prior to the Conservancy's existence, Tahone was mostly a black hole um, botanically. It wasn't well understood, but there are there are some older records. But then, since the Conservancy came into existence, a number of different folks have collected um, records um, okay. that exist at uh, Jepson. Um, and other herbaria as well. Um, and uh, it's, it's certainly something that can still be done. I mean, uh, the, uh, the botanical diversity of Tahona is still being discovered. I mean, uh, we, we, the, the species discoveries have tapered a little bit in the last five or six years, but there are still localities that are unknown that are, that are waiting to be discovered. So if any, you know, Sue, if you wanna, you wanna do some collections, uh, let's talk uh, and we can-, we can um. <laughs> So I, we might sort of be talking a little bit at cross purposes because the, to examine phenological change, you need hundreds of specimens per species oh, distributed yeah. over time, not just like voucher specimens, obviously. Um, so what, what I was thinking about that motivated the question was because it was private land for so long and um, botanists generally didn't have easy access to it, I thought maybe it would be more of a, uh, there'd be more of a deficit of herbarium specimens and specimen records for Tejon relative to, you know, national forest or BLM land, which is a lot more. Yeah, I'm sure there. I'm sure there is a deficit comparing between, you know, public land versus private land. Mm -hmm. um, there are many. Um, Neil Neil Kramer, who was on the call, has collected many, many, many voucher specimens. Um, for example, but yeah, uh, it's 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 not easy um, to to get, um, and I say that kind of glibly. It's not easy to get permission to do collections onto home. There's a process that has to be followed. Um, so yes, uh, certainly still something that's possible. But in terms of the the repetition that you'd be looking for to to understand um, phenology amongst other things, uh, I. <laughs> Depending, Neil would be the one to uh, to really answer it, but um, I would suspect we don't have that. Well, we we do have a, a a contribution from Susan Fawcett, who apparently did a quick search on CCH two and came up with four thousand six hundred and seventy two. So, <laughs> uh, uh, <clears throat> I'll interject there as well and uh, acknowledge uh, Nick Jensen, who did uh, for his PhD did a uh, a floor of the ranch, which included uh, numbers approaching 5,000 collections. So, and those are primarily down at uh, Rancho Santa Ana. Absolutely. Cool. There, there's, uh, there's one more question in the chat here. Um, other than oak slash acorns and quote buckwheat, um, and then in parentheses, was that actually an edible buckwheat? What other edible species from pre-colonization days are still there and what have been lost? Mm, well, my generic answer to that is uh, I, I, don't, I don't recommend eating native plants uh, unless you really know what you're doing. I don't know what I'm doing, to be honest. There are, um, there are plants that are edible. The buckwheats, generally speaking, are edible to my knowledge, so I would assume it's edible, but it, I wouldn't, I would never eat it. Um, uh, there are, the alliums are edible, uh, as far as I know. Um, <clears throat> I, I know I'm going to think of probably a handful of species that are, in theory, edible as soon as we're done with our call, um, but uh, off the top of my head, uh, no. Oh, but there, oh, speaking of tribal connections, though, I was on a tour one time, and, and someone on the tour happened to be um, part of the Chumash uh, a tribe, and he had written a book on edible California native plants that I had purchased as an undergrad, and it was really interesting to meet him. Um, many of those species do occur on Tejon, but for whatever reason, my brain's not working on what those edibles are. It's getting late. It's getting late. There's a question as, that says all the geophytes, all the geophytes. Rachel, can you want to explain that a little? <laughs> oh, many, apparently she, she doesn't want to speak, but she says many are edible. <clears throat> um, okay, that runs 
out uh, of oh, dog in background. <laughs> um, that runs out the questions. Does anyone uh, want to unmute themselves and ask any other questions or say hi or um, anything? Hi. <laughs> there you go. It's good to see everyone. So Mitchell, do you really like Atroplex? I love Atroplex, Dr. Mo. <laughs> I'm for, forever Atroplex. <laughs> That's oh, an we just had another, set, another question come in. Are the salt exuding or sequest sequestering done by halophytes like Atroplex as an adaptation to hypersaline environments also an adaptation against water stress? That's ah. a good, that's a really good question. Ah. And <clears throat> something that uh, more than one member of my committee is grilling me on is how do you account for drought? And so that's the next step. Uh, you can't just pick, eco, when doing these ecological studies, you can't just pick a part one ecological trait and say, that's it. You got to account for other things. And so, um, yes, uh, that's a good question. And the, the short of it is yes, uh, 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 you know, uh, tolerance to salinity certainly is um, one mechanism of avoiding drought stress. Uh, but <laughs> evolution, or halophytes are polyphyletic, and so they uh, evolve from multiple different lineages. And so it's hard to it's hard to say to generalize. Um, of course, uh, Andy Simpson was there first. Yes, yeah, so I'm the one who asked the climate change question. Um, I'm. A little bit skeptical that we know what the uh, what the moist what what climate change is going to do to rainfall patterns. So we, we we I think we have a reasonable idea of what it's going to do to temperature, but rainfall. I'm a, I'm a, I I I distrust our models, which is why I was asking about uh, which is why I was asking about pass about tracking it through time. Is there any other information you have regarding what? What we're, what we're anticipating as far as climate change is concerned? Well, I can only tell you what I've heard from others. Uh, there is um, a climate modeler at UC Riverside in, in the Botany and Plant Sciences Department. She's actually the one who let me use that figure that it used the climate water deficit model, which she, by her own admission, is not a super accurate model. Um, so I share your skepticism of models. I mean, I think skepticism of models is always warranted. Um, they're not all one and the same. Um, but yes, um, speaking as a layperson, not knowing much about models, um, <laughs> my sense is that uh, uh, precipitation patterns stand to become more erratic, but predicting exactly how that's going to shape out is anyone's guess. Yeah, I was actually just about to ask that is what about what about the possibility of average rainfall not changing, but the variance in how wet wet years are and how dry dry years are increasing, because that mm -hmm. seems to be something we might be observing. Yeah, if you look at, it, you know, over the scale of decades, the mean rainfall might not vary, but we know we, we just, I mean, between 2012 and what was it, 2017, we had that long-term high intensity drought. We're sort of in another one now. Yeah, long-term high intensity drought, then, then unbelievably wet year, then drought year, then unbelievably wet year, then at least short-term, very high intensity drought. That's what, that's what uh, they're saying is, is the new norm. Uh, based on my very, very basal understanding. Um, absolutely. Oh, there's, oh, I... uh, well, there's a uh, question here from a, a hand raised by IPXS0419. Ah, nice to meet you, IPX0419. Um, I'll see. Question? Yeah, yeah, there's a question. Sorry, can you guys hear me now? Yes, hello. There we go. So my question is, I've been noticing all over um, pretty much California, but you have some areas that aren't really affected by pollution. Are you noticing that the riparian areas are losing vegetation? They're still getting water year round, but are they dying off like everywhere else in California because of drought conditions? Because I'm wondering if there's more 
uh, other factors, uh, plastics, pollution in the air, things that are driving tree death more than just the drought? That's a good question. And so just speaking from a boots on the ground perspective, in 2021, this is some sad news, in 2021, um, because our rainfall was so low, I can point to a dozen places on Tahone alone where there was some relatively young emergent riparian vegetation that's now dead, just because the water table went down that far. Um, so um, yes, what was the, you had another part of your question. Um, uh, uh, what was it again? Um, the I first part with the food or the, the latest with just the trees oh, dying pollution. out. Pollution. pollution, pollution. Okay, yes, well, that's uh, another sad thing. The San Joaquin Desert, uh, Bakersfield um, essentially, has some of the worst air pollution in the country. Um, it's not our fault, it, you know, it's a bathtub that other stuff comes in and stays put. Um, when the rain washes out, it's really quite beautiful. Um, so on that side of the ranch, high rates of nitrogen deposition amongst other things. Um, but if you contrast that to the other side of the ranch, the Mojave Desert where windfall patterns are high, or it was very always windy over there, um, relatively low air pollution, that's a, a, a generalization. So if you contrasted nitrogen deposition between those two general areas of the ranch and its effect on vegetation dynamics, I suspect you'd find it different. But it's probably a complicated question or complicated question to try to answer. Um, there's a few folks who have examined um, community dynamics of uh, annual plants uh, in relation to nitrogen deposition on the ranch and the, uh, the inversion layer. Um, so that, that actually that research is going on still. And so folks are thinking along those lines, um, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll use the excuse again of, of not being hugely familiar with the uh, pollution literature. <laughs> I hope that's helpful though. We have a comment, a comment in the chat from Julie Evans um, about data over time to look at drought complications in monitoring those changes. I'm, I'm, I have to admit, I'm not quite sure I understand exactly what you're saying, but in, in uh, Akinescence has polyploided and shown many physiological trait differences across the yeah. West and has expanded into different niches in the desert. And there's a link to a um, PDF on that, um, on that subject for people who are interested. Yeah. So thank you for I, that. Uh, yeah, I'm familiar with this. Um, is this the Sibilis? OK, yes, a more recent one. Um, there, there's, uh, it's probably, this probably cites Sibilis 1980 something in here as well uh, that goes a lot into the ploidy of Atroplex specifically. It's, it's all over the place. And um, <laughs> in fact, it was Tito, one of Amy's graduate students who asked about ploidy and how do you account for that? <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> but um, the specific, especially of atriplex, the ploidy levels are, are, are weird, are weird, definitely. Um, that would be cool to, to, to do a study. I mean, as is pointed out, there, there are people who are working on it. Well, as somebody somebody who is not on your committee, but um, worries about graduate students, I just want to say you can't do everything. You can't <laughs> do everything. Focus, focus. Uh, so um, that seems to be the end of the questions in the chat. Again, does anybody have anything else? I mean, people can stay as long as Mitchell can handle it. Um, I'm at my in-law's house. The kids are over there. And so uh, I've got... I have permission to be here. So yeah, I, I have to apologize for um, docking you one kid in the introduction. I only remember two, and, and I was a little embarrassed when I saw your picture that pretty clearly had three. <laughs> Not at all. She's a coronial. Um, a lot of folks still haven't met her. So <laughs> <clears throat> any other questions? Well, if not, they. Thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been well, fun. It's my, it's, my, it's my time to thank you. It's my time to thank you for a really, really, really interesting presentation. And as you can see, you know, people stayed for 20 minutes to ask questions. So obviously people found it really interesting and, uh, uh, you know, um, informative.